Q proposition in here is every now and then. It's like the opposite of category. Oh, yeah. Because many Q examples are examples and many other examples. <laughs> exactly. So I uh, try to give like sketches of groups whenever I can. So let's say you have a set X, uh, a topology on X, which we did not refer as script P, subscript X is basically a collection of, of subsets of X. It's a collection of subsets of X. set and x uh, are elements of this collection uh, in arbitrary union of, of sets from from the topology. Uh, it's also an element of the topology and finite intersection. So these sets are called open sets. And the whole point of defining a topology on a space is so that we can. Uh, so we want we want to talk about proximity of points in a particular set, uh, but we want to make it not as rigid as say by directly defining like a distance between any two points. We want there to be some sort of flexibility. We want to be able to stretch things around and like deform stuff. So uh, the way to think about it is, let's say you have a bunch of points, say three points, and there's an open set that covers all three of them, an open set that covers only two of them. So because this open set is included in this open set, we can conclude that these two points are closer than these two points. Uh, so in some sense, it gives you a visual, uh, non-rigid definition of distances without explicitly de defining a metric. Metric is something we'll define later in this uh, in this in today's talk. Um, but yeah, so some standard examples are in the trivial topology, uh, which only consists of the null set and the set itself, and no other set is open. So this is 
typically how one defines open set, but in practice, when you have to, uh, you, we often have to check whether a set is open and there's a very tautological result that is useful in doing that. Um, and that is a set U is open if and only if uh, for all elements in that open set uh, there exists an open set V such that X belongs to V and V is completely contained in U. So if you have an open set U, you can pick an you should be able to pick an arbitrary point X and an arbitrary open set V that contains X that is completely contained within U. For every such point X there should exist such a V. Uh, this this def this uh, the right hand side of this statement is the definition of a neighborhood, or rather an open neighborhood. The word open in front of neighborhood is usually skipped, so we we'll always assume that when we're talking about neighborhoods, we're talking about open neighborhoods, unless mentioned explicitly, otherwise explicitly. Uh, so a neighborhood is basically an open set. Uh, a neighborhood of a point X is an open set such that uh, there exists a, a, a subset that's also open that includes that. Um, so this is pretty much tautological because for an open set, you, it, it basically suggests that uh, the open set can be written as the union of all subset Vs. Um, so, it, so the open set is a union of open sets with, as in the definition of a topology. And the open set is itself a neighborhood of every point. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, it's a very tautological result, but it's surprisingly useful when it comes to proofs. Um, So if, uh, by, by definition, a set is open if and only if it is an element of the topology on that set. So on any set, I can define multiple different topologies. Uh, and like a, a subset of that set would be open in some topology and may not be open in another topology. Does that make sense? Or is it's open? How do you define it? It's just like element of the topology. They're just called open sets. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, so we gave the example. So on any set you can introduce material topology where almost nothing is open. I see, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. And on every set you can introduce the discrete topology where every set is open, i.e. every element of one element is set to be open. So everything falls apart from this set. Exactly. So everything is set to be open. Um that's what I said. Yeah. So another example would be the real line with uh, open sets given by arbitrary unions of intervals of the form A comma B of open intervals. Uh, and this defines what is called the standard topology on real lines. Uh, this is typically what you learn in your first course of analysis. That's how you define open sets in real line through the distance formula, which is uh, the distance between two real numbers is given by modulus of A minus B, and this set is basically defined as the open interval of A comma B is the set of points X such that uh, mod X minus A is less than mod A minus B. Yeah. Oh, so V does not have to be equal to U. V has to be a strict subset of U, not. Uh, okay. So, I mean, how does that work with this example we have before, right? Like, X, Y is defined as open. Mm -hmm. Y is in X, Y. And there's no subset that's contained in Y. Oh. No, X, Y itself is a. Wait. Oh, 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 then. Yeah, you're right. Sorry. It doesn't have to be a strict, strict subset. It can be the set. Yeah, it can be the set itself. 
everything sounds like the same thing. So, you know, you know. Exactly. It's, it's yeah. completely <laughs> not logical. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we'll see an example. Yeah. We'll see an example where this is a very useful statement <laughs> later. Um, uh, the last line we wrote is not true. It has to be x minus mean of a and b less than. Oh, oh, right, right, right. Oh, or alternately, and x minus b is then minus b. Oh, uh, so, and like, whenever you take a course on basic real analysis, you learn that any interval that does not include the endpoints is an open set. Uh, and the way we define open sets, these open intervals are points on the real line that lie between A and B. That is, points whose distance from A is less than this distance and whose distance from B is less than this distance as well. Okay. Um, and like this is a strict inequality because otherwise the point A and B would be included here as well. So for arbitrary A's and B's. So the, the set of all intervals of this form and all their arbitrary units form the standard topology on, on the real line. Okay. I mean, you also need to check the finite intersections of these things and then the yeah. same set on the machine more or less on Yeah, so it's like if you take any any two open intervals, they can either intersect in an open interval or they're just not intersecting. And also A and B can be merged. Yeah, if you're working on the real line with infinity. <laughs> Or like just the entire real line itself. Okay. Um, great. So that's is what's on the screen here. Like is that how it shows up on the video? Uh, yeah, sure, you can, you can always do that. So that would be a different topology. I'll call it example five. It will be x is x comma y, and t is... Oh, yeah, that is the discrete topology. Yeah, but that's the smallest example of a topology that's neither trivial nor non-trivial. Exactly. So, uh, you still have to make sure that all these three properties are satisfied. Because, for instance, if you have a set with three elements, A, B, and C, uh, and you try and think of um, the open sets as B, C, and the whole thing, this is a topology because it's closed down the arbitrary unions and closed down the finite intersections. But if you take this subset of the power set, this is not a topology because you can take the intersection of this set and this set is just a singleton set B, but that's not included in your in your topology. So this is not an example of a topology. It's just some subset of the power set. Is there a procedure which is called the topology? Mm -hmm. um, so you can so you can take any uh, topology in sets and you can generate a topology by yeah. taking all possible unions and all possible So, yeah, a uh, base is a little more constrained than that. It, it's a way to eliminate the need to take intersections, but yeah, we'll get to that. Uh, the next definition is, let's say you have a subset of your topological space with topology P. Um, you can define something called the interior of this subset as the union of all open sets you contain in M. Oh. 
So if you have a set M, pretend uh, this is a subset of like the plane. So, some parts include the boundary, some parts don't. Uh, the interior of this of this set M is just the union of all open sets included in these. So it will be this domain without the boundary in the standard example of the real plane. So when I say open, I mean just included uh, those fields that are elements of the So this is like this level of the Yeah. Yes, it's not a it's not a topology, it's just an open set. It's the union of all oh, these open sets. Oh it's like the it's like the topology of the topic, right? Yeah. So the next thing is, is Let's say you have a real line with a closed interval A to B. Um, it's a closed interval line with a subset of the real line. So, yeah. Uh, what if what if I consider something like this? Is it uh, is this open or closed? Mm -hmm. It's only in the end of the not open in the real line. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So it's it's not open in real in the real line, but it's open in A and B. But how do I make that more precise? A simpler way of saying that is just take intersection of all open sets with M. So this this interval would be open in R, and its intersection with M is this thing. So uh, it's basically a subset U of M, which is open. 
So when I when I say U is open, uh, uh, U as a subset of M is open. What I mean is open in the M. Right, right. Um, no, I mean when you talk about the world, like whether the boundaries are open, right? Mm -hmm. Because it is open or not. In the sense of open is also the same as the sense of open. So. Um, so when I'm talking about R2, yeah. R like the rail line, yeah. the, I'm using the standard topology on that. So like anything that does not have the boundary in R2 in the standard topology is open. Because uh, because of that proposition over there, if if it includes the boundary, then for the boundary point, there is no open set that is completely contained within that set and contains the set. The point. Oh, so A and B must be different. Uh, like they're not like, the same as matrices. Yeah. Oh, using using this proposition, so we have. It's, it's, a, it's an open interval. There's a strict inequality. Oh, 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 oh. So the distance can never be less than zero. Okay. 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 Right. So yeah. So basically, we're using this proposition. If you have, if you have uh, some set that includes the boundary and can look at this point, yeah. there's no way you can come up with any open set around this point that's completely included in the, in the standard topology. Okay. And there's many other examples of exotic boundaries. Something that you'll never use unless you're a abstract topologist. Uh, so the next thing is now that we've defined open sets, the only the, the other kind of sets that remain that we can like see in analysis are closed sets. Now, at least on the real line, uh, we know that closed sets are defined using closed intervals, which So the definition of an open set depends on what topology you're looking at. 
So on the real line, we have closed intervals are something so now you're saying on the real line, but you're not specifying the topology. Oh, in the standard topology. So whenever I talk about the real line or the real plane, I'm always going to refer to the standard topology. What is uh, the sets of unions oh, okay. of open intervals? So on real line, on the real line with the standard topology, we know from real analysis that closed intervals are the classical examples of closed sets, and we can take like finite and finite unions of these intervals to get closed sets. For instance, zero comma one, three, two comma three would be the canonical example, another example of the closed set. But how do we, uh, in order to define this, again, we need the modulus function, which is the distance function on the real line. But we're not allowed to use that. We need to define this in the topological setting only. Any suggestions on how to do that? All we know about is what the open sets are. You said you're not allowed to use the distance function. Yeah. But you use it to define the distance. To give an example. But uh, there, there has to be a definition. In, in the case of the real line in particular, uh, I can use the distance function to, to define it right in an arbitrary topological space. If I want to generalize the idea of closed sets in an arbitrary topological space, I can't use the distance functions in the real line. I can't use it. So, any ideas? The only thing I know so far are what open sets are. <laughs> There's all these yeah, issues yeah. because all you know as of now, uh, in order to define typically an analysis on like real on the real set line or plane or whatever, you define boundaries and closures using limit forms. So the sequence is if the sequence converges, it converges to a point, and for convergence you need the distance function. But like Johan said, uh, you can always write this as uh, the real line minus uh, the set of points given by. Zero, union one two, union three to infinity. So we've taken this closed set and written it as the complement of an open set. And that's what defines closed sets in a general topological space. So closed sets are sets, subsets M. Uh, let me call this M subset of X such that N can be written as minus q where u is open. X minus n. Uh, yeah, so here's here's an interesting thing. Uh, a set in, in 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 a topological space, a subset does not have to be either closed or open. It can be both closed and open. The standard examples are um, Consider the null set. So from the definition of topology, we have the null set belongs to any topology on X, it has to. Uh, we also have X belongs to this topology, again from the definition. But I know that I can write phi as X minus X. And yeah, <laughs> or, and I can write x as x minus phi. So phi is open, x is open, but phi is also closed, and so is x. Mm -hmm. There can be more. And whether there are more examples or not are, is related to whether the space is connected, which we'll get to. Uh, so these these sorts of sets are called open sets, which is a very weird name, but the audience use it. Um, so these are sets that are both closed and open. So so we started out defining topology with. By defining open sets, we can alternately just ignore open sets and start out by defining closed sets, uh, and then define open sets as closed sets that are complements of closed sets. Uh, using this following theorem, we have 
that. Um, the null set and the full set are closed. Uh, arbitrary intersections of closed sets are also closed. And finite unions of closed sets are closed. we could have started out by defining a topology by saying that it's a subset uh, is a, it's a it's a collection of subsets that obey these properties and we call those subsets closed sets and then if we define open sets as complements of closed sets we have got the properties of open sets as a theorem which are the definition Oh, uh, so phi and x are closed because of this. Um, and then if you, so any any closed set can be written as the complement of an open set. Uh, so from, from the definition of the topology, we have uh, an arbitrary union, let's say from an index, from an indexing set i uh, of open sets, the i is open. Uh, so let's look at the complement of this. Under a complement, this becomes an arbitrary intersection of the complements of VIs, which are closed. Now, because this set is open, its complement has to be closed. So an arbitrary intersection of closed sets is also closed. Similarly, for finite unions, uh, finite, the finite intersection of open sets is open, take the complement, you get finite unions of closed sets that has to be closed. The so next thing to do is define, now we come to the closure of a set. So the interior of a set was the largest open set that's included in the set. Any ideas for what the closure is? So, just by the way it's been named, we know that it's going to be a closed set. Right? Yeah. So what sort of closed set are we looking for? So try to think about it from a visual perspective. It, at least within the real, uh, any RN, uh, Euclidean space, we want something that includes all the boundary points. Uh, it's a closed set that includes all the boundary points and nothing more. What, what property does this closed set have? Well, you could get the closed set. Of all open sets inside it, of all open sets. Uh, inside, outside, in the interior. Well, but that would include points that aren't included in the set. Like if I have the open disk, I want the closure of that to be the closed disk, which is including all the boundary points which are not part of it. You close, you're very close. Basically, the answer is you take uh, the intersection with closed sets that are, could potentially be like outside of, like all closed sets that have been like outside. Exactly. Of Exactly. Okay. So the closure of a set is defined as the set of uh, closed sets C. It's not a set of closed sets. Oh, uh, intersection of closed sets C such that C contains M. Alternately, it's the smallest closed set that covers M. Right. We 
any questions? Yeah. And since the closure, so we, we also have that the interior of any set is a subset of that set, which is a subset of its closure. Because the interior is the union of every set contained in M, uh, and the closure is the intersection of sets that contain M.
So the next definition is that of a separable set. Yeah. Um, a topological space X is called separable with an RDF that exists a countable dense structure. energy eigenfunctions of the Hilbert space. The energy eigenfunctions are typically labeled by integers. So that's that's exactly the same space. Yeah. So that's that's exactly the same uh, statement as here, which it basically says that the set, the set of energy eigenfunctions of a quantum mechanical system are dense in the Hilbert space. Because any wave function can be written as a series as a series expansion in those energy eigenfunctions. Next is the boundary. Uh, yep. So you said that the Hilbert spaces can be separable, mm -hmm. but then what's the topology? Uh, there is a standard topology that can be defined space as a vector space. Uh, we get to that towards the end because uh, Hilbert space is basically a normed vector space, a uh, vector space with a norm function that assigns a dense to every vector. And using the norm, you can define a distance between any two vectors in the Hilbert space. And using that distance, you can define a topology just like you did for the real line. The boundary of a subset of a topological space is defined as So, know that the boundary of a set does not necessarily have to include, uh, can, can include points that are not in the set. Uh, when we get to manifolds, the boundary is defined slightly differently. And for manifolds with boundary, you can have points. You, you cannot, I mean, because there's nothing outside the manifold, there's not really a point in the boundary that's not in the manifold. But there's a, there's just, just uh, I wanted to point out this slight difference between topology and differential geometry. So in, in the topological sense, if you're working on a manifold, you'd find that the boundary, the topological boundary of that manifold is the null set. That, that 
that's just weird, so we don't need that that much. Yeah. Now we get to maps between topological spaces. Uh, a continuous map. Space to X. Is defined to be continuous if and only if uh, for every V open in Y, the inverse image uh, is open in X. So F is called a continuous map in that case. There's also continuity at a point. F is defined to be continuous at a point X if for all uh, V open in Y such that V includes F of X, F inverse of V is open Uh, inverse of a set is always defined. It's just a set. Okay. It's the pre-image. It's okay. just a set of all points that map into the set. So it doesn't have to be an invertible function for that. Uh, so you just connect this with the epsilon uh, I was planning to do that when we get to multiple spaces. Right. Oh. Okay. So in In the real line, for example, we define continuity slightly separately, uh, continuity slightly differently uh, using the epsilon delta definition. And we say that f is continuous at x if for all positive epsilon there exists uh, a delta that's positive such that um, f of y minus f of x oops, for, for all y that that lies in an epsilon neighborhood of de uh, in a delta neighborhood of x we have f of y in an epsilon neighborhood of f of x so if I look at the real line, I look at x, and look at the delta neighborhood of this, this maps into an epsilon neighborhood of f of x for all such epsilon. This is exactly the same as saying that the inverse image of this open interval around f of x has to be open and localized around f of x. Oh, this is a continuity on X. And this is just continuity at a particular point. So this is equivalent to F being continuous at every element of, of the set. So now that we have defined topological spaces and maps between topological spaces, we can define the category top of 
topological spaces whose mm-hmm. objects. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So such a map, the set of continuous maps uh, between topological spaces x and y, usually the t x and t y as a corresponding notation, is called c x y. Uh, so we introduce it. I mean, that's the epsilon delta is sort of similar to saying that as well. Right? Uh, what it says is we first fix epsilon, and then we look for a delta for each epsilon. So when we fix epsilon, what we're doing is fixing an open set on the right hand side, and then we're looking at the inverse proper, the inverse image of this on the left hand side. We're saying that the inverse image of this must include an open interval around x. So why do you find it in this way as opposed to the other way, which is sort of all equivalently? Why don't you just say we're all uh, v belonging to the topology in X, mm-hmm. f of v belongs to Because that's not a continuous map. That's something called an open map, which is different. It's a different kind of map. It's not equivalent. No, so again, over here, what we're fixing first is the right-hand side. It's an open set on the right-hand side. And then we're looking at its tree image on the left hand side. Um, That's where the inverse in, uh, comes in, which is what we did here. Just give them an example of a continuous function, just to remember. I can't remember any of that super. Yeah. <laughs> so. If x squared maps the real line to only the positive. This in the epsilon delta definition, we fix epsilon and then look for a delta for each epsilon. If we if we if the definition required the other way around, by fixing delta first and then looking for an epsilon for every delta, then we it would probably correspond to the definition of an open map. So that usually is suppressed. It shouldn't principally be x comma dx and y comma dy because in order to define continuity, you need both. So it's assumed to go on. Yeah. Okay. So so then that's when you define this category whose objects are topological spaces. And morphisms between two topological spaces x and y are given by the set of continuous maps. So um, the next thing is now we have continuous maps, we can define whether two topological spaces are equivalent to each other uh, by defining the homeomorphism. So 
Homeomorphism in between two topological spaces X and Y is defined as uh, as, a, as an invertible function that's both continuous and uh, has a continuous inverse. This is with, uh, so homeomorphisms are basically isomorphisms in the category of topological spaces. So they define an equivalence of different topological spaces. At least as far as ambiguity is concerned, we don't really need to distinguish between the two, two topological spaces. If they So the inverse, so if I have a set of the image, then F inverse of V is a well-defined quantity. It's just this, the set of points in X that map into V. That doesn't mean that the function F inverse exists, because you could have a many-to-one function. Yeah. Even if you have a many-to-one function, the, F, uh, the inverse image of a single point yeah. exists. It's just all the points that map into V. That, so that defines a set. Yeah, so this is a set, yes. but f inverse is not is not necessarily a map. For f inverse to be a function, it has f has to be bijective. Okay, so it's just the definition of it. Yeah. At this point, it's useful to know like what the the whole point <coughs> yeah. of the field is, but it does because let's give an example. Something easier, like a circle and a figure. Yeah. So if you have a real line. So can anyone explain why the circle and the figure eight are not one another? Right. By figure eight, I mean figure eight has a subset of artificial Okay. Yeah. So the Why does, why does this not hold true? I mean, it certainly has to do with the crossing point. What about it? Yeah, so the claim is that they are not only one. Say there's a, a homeomorphism between them. Then, and let's say the top point of the circle matched to the center point of the figure. Uh, what breaks down? Well, so as you go around the figure eight, you come back to the center point, but you have necessarily gone around the circle. Okay. Sure, but that's kind of a, I mean, that's pretty complicated. Now you have to go around, and there's like an argument about the paths and some. This code that I finished with my head in this video. Uh -huh. yeah. so that's closer. Right. So if I take a neighborhood of the center point of figure eight and I and I uh, poke it at the center, so I 
this group of little separate minutes are. It consists of what, like four separate intervals, right? Four separate open intervals as they all work. This and this group. And they have to map the four separate open intervals and there's no other way right there for them to map to each other. Take this open set, which is the set of these four intervals. Its inverse image can only be something like this, which is two disjoint intervals. There's no way to make four separate intervals that connect onto one point on the circuit, which leads to another topic that we get to. Let me just show you So, like, the, so the, the principal goal of topology in general is exactly this type of question. If you have two double x spaces, tell me, how are they? Basically, you can say that the goal of topology is to come up with the set of all possible topological invariants that a topological space can have. So that if you want to check if two spaces are homeomorphic to one another, you can just compare all this, all the topological invariants that the two spaces have. If they're all the same, they're, and you should be able to conclude that they're homeomorphic, and if they're not, they're not. So all these examples in physics, you know, like winding numbers, trend numbers, etc. Their only role is to distinguish between uh, a certain topological spaces. My question is that um, I'm not sure how, uh, from just looking at it, everything, how you're saying that if there are four intersections that are matching onto two, that's not possible. Uh, I'm, I'm going to define that next. <laughs> so you need you need the notion of something called connectedness for that. Uh, the definition of connected space. So a space X is connected if and only if uh, the null set and X are the only sets that are both closed and open in, in whatever topology you're working on. So if there exists uh, another set which is not the null set or the entire space uh, that is both closed and open, then you can say that the set is um, the way to think about it is, let's say you have this the set of two disks in R2. This one is an open disk, this is also an open disk. Uh, under the subspace topology for this topological space, this disk is the complement of this. So this is both closed and open, and this desk is a complement of this. So this is also closed and open. So we can say that this topological space X is disconnected. It's nothing outside. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just uh, the set X consists of just these two disks. As a subs under, under the subspace topology used from R2. So you're not considering anything outside of the two disks yeah. when you say that like the one disk is a exactly. complement of the other. Exactly. Com the complement under X. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. 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 In, under the subspace topology. And we need that encoding for those things. Yes. Are you going to give the long definition? Yeah, uh, I'm about to. Uh, alternately, 
x is connected if and only if it can be written as uh, if, it, if and only if it can't be written as a union of disjoint open sets or of disjoint closed sets. So even if you can write it as a union of two disjoint closed sets, it will be discounted. So the figure eight minus the center point is if this connectivity should be top root and bottom root of top. Yeah. But the circle minus that point is not. If you remove that point, you just get an open bit, like something that's equivalent to an open bit or a line with non points. So is that disconnected or is that implied? That's the next proposition. <laughs> so this proposition is basically that connectedness is a topological invariant. And it basically says that if F is a map from X to Y uh, and X is connected, continuous map from x to y, uh, and if x is connected, then the image of x under x is connected. And the way to prove this is that, assume this is, let's, uh, let's say we prove by contradiction. Assume f of, f of x is disconnected, that means it can be written as a disjoint union of two open sets then the inverse image of one of those open sets has to be open, but the inverse image of one of those open sets cannot uh, be all of x. Similarly, uh, oh, sorry, hold on, let, me, let me write this down. So f of x can be written as a union b, where a is open and b is open. Since b is open, a is also closed. By continuity, F inverse of A is both open and closed. And F inverse of A cannot be all of F, all of X, because then F of F inverse of A would be all of all of F of X. Uh, so we found a subset of X that's both open and closed, which means X can't be, which X can't be uh, connect. So that's a contradiction. Because it's a complement of an open set. There's a uh, these are two both A and B are disjoint. So it fits in there is the proposition that uh, two images of disjoint sets are disjoint. Yes. Yeah, that's true. No, but uh, in this case, for for the left hand side, I'm not even using disjointedness. I'm using the first definition. We found a cloping set that's yeah. not. Hmm? It's complement needs to be the other transform. No, but this is an open and closed set. Mm -hmm. Because it's an open set, it's an inverse image is open by the definition of continuity. Because it's a closed set, it's inverse image is closed by the properties of continuity. Mm -hmm. So when you call that open set of three images, mm -hmm. it has to be either X or Z. Yeah. But if the pre image is empty, then its image cannot be non empty. The pre image is x, then b is empty. Because we already know that the image is a. Or, or a subset of a. Why does that work? That you said if a is closed, the image of a is also closed. Hmm. Uh, 
just from the properties of continuity. Oh, did I did I not mention that? Oh, uh, so continuity is defined as inverse image of open sets is open. Take the complement of that, and you get that for continuous function inverse image of closed sets is closed. No, it's not the disjoint. The union of disjoint sets is not the same as disjoint union of closed sets. Uh, disjoint union, do you want the categorical definition or the representative definition? Wait, so a topological invariant. So a topological invariant is something that's preserved by continuous maps. So as we saw, connectedness of X implies connectedness of F of X. So that's topologically. So if that's essentially homeomorphism, then that's why it's not oh, okay. homeomorphism, because it has to be preserved by the homeomorphism. Okay. And the last definition that has Wait, to be. I have a quick yeah. question, this is kind of formality, I guess. If you say that two topological spaces are isomorphic, do you usually have to qualify that about what map you're talking about, or if you define a single map, can you say that they're isomorphic? Right. It's the latter. Yeah, uh, as, as long as there's one map, okay. that's only one map. Okay. So, so you just asked if it's a couple of hours later, and someone could talk about it, homomorphic maps, or? So, uh, if, you, if you look at, um, yeah. in general, usually homomorphic, but it's implied. It, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's implied through this theorem. So in, connectedness is preserved under con continuous maps, but if F was instead a homeomorphism, then I mean, homeomorphism is continuous by Exactly. That's why. Exactly. So then in, in that case, F of X will be all of Y, because F has to be invertible. So the definition of topological invariance is mm homeomorphism, -hmm. it's like it's preserved by continuous maps. Uh, homeomorphism. Yeah. 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 So from the picture of the two disks, we can intuitively say that that space X consists of two components which are disconnected from each other. But what, how do we define what these components are? So uh, for any topological space X, we can define an equivalence relation theta by saying that two elements X Y are equivalent if and only if there exists a subset A of X such that A is connected and uh, X and Y both belong to A. Uh, so basically, if you, if you can put them into a connected set, then they're equivalent. And for every equivalence, uh, for, for every equivalence relation, you can break up the set into a set of equivalence classes, which are uh, the sets, which are sets of all elements that are equivalent to each other. Uh, so the equivalence class of X is denoted by square bracket X in square brackets. And these equivalence classes are called the connected components. So the picture being, let's say you have a bunch of disks as the topological space. You, take, you can take two points in any of these disks, and they'll be equivalent to one another because they belong, because I can come up with a subset that is connected and includes both of them. So any two of these points uh, are always going to be equivalent to each other. So this is one particular equivalence class. Similarly, this is going to be another equivalence class. This is going to be a third equivalence class. So each equivalence class is a
probably is going to fix some topology dimension. Some very nasty. Um, not necessarily. But as long as it's in the Here we reduce, we took a set, we defined an equivalence relation on that and reduced it to the set of equivalence classes. Uh, there's a, it's a first, you just like that. It's not in the definition that A is connected, but uh, so A is open. But isn't it because it's just saying that X is an open set? X is. Um, I mean, you can extend that definition for subsets of X as well. Yeah, so. I'm just looking at a subset of X, right? A subset doesn't have to be an X. Okay, okay. So all, all I need is a subset of X that is connected. Uh, so it doesn't have to be open or closed with the topology on X, but it can be open or closed with the reduced topology. Okay. And subspace topology. Okay. Uh, it will be open and closed with the subspace topology. Okay. So, so you're saying it's, so when you're saying connected, you mean connected in the subspace topology? Yes. Yeah. So basically, the procedure we did here was take a set, have an equivalence relation, and reduce it to a set of equivalence classes. There's a specific name for that, and it's called quotienting. So for for a set X and an equivalence relation theta, the set of equivalence classes uh, that, def that this equivalence relation defines on the set is called the quotient set. And now if X is a topological space, there is a way of defining a topology on this quotient set by the equivalence relation as well. Uh, and that is called the quotient topology. Oh, um, let me just add one more thing here. There is a canonical map I from X to X mod tilde that takes every element X its equivalence class to the quotient set. So the quotient topology is defined as. Sorry. Hmm. Um, what is the rabbit form? Oh, it's just, it, it, it's defined by this. It takes an element in X and outputs the equivalence class of that element. Do this. Um, so when we're trying to define a topology on the quotient set, what we need to do is prescribe a set of open sets. Uh, and the canonical way to do that is to make phi continuous. If the projection map is, if phi is called the projection map, and if it's continuous, uh, there's only one topology for which that can happen, and it's called the quotient topology, uh, defined by d x mod tilde d those sets b such that V can be written as phi inverse of U for U open in X. Any questions? So under this quotient topology, the map, the projection map phi is going to be continuous. Alternate definition of this uh, using something called quotient maps. 
where we don't talk about equivalence relations first, we, talk, we try to define a generalized version of this map phi. So consider a map, a surjective map, phi from a topological space x to a set y. So there's no topology on y. This is a topological space? No, to the left of pi. Oh, uh, sur surjective. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, uh, su such a surjective map pi is called a quotient map. If, um, oh, sorry. These are both topological spaces. Such a, uh, such a subjective map pi is called a quotient map. If for all u open in y, you have pi inverse u open in x and the converse. So it's a subjective map that is open, that such, such that if I take, uh, that is open such that if I take an open set in x, uh, I will its image will be an open set in Y and also continuous, so that if I take an open set in Y, its free image will be open in X. Such a map is called quotient map. And now, in order to connect with this, I basically need, let me call this different map by delta from a topological space X. into a set Z. Um, and I'll define the quotient topology on Z uh, as the unique, this is defined uniquely as the, uh, is this finest or coarsest? Uh, as the <laughs> largest topology on Z that makes pi a quotient map, pi tilde a quotient map. Oh, so this is also called finest. So basically, if you have two topologies, T1 and T2, on the same set, uh, uh, such that T1 is contained in T2, so T2 is larger than T1. T2 is said to be finer than T1, and T1 is said to be coarser than T2. Oh, okay. Homeomorphism has to be both, it has to be a bijective function, so it's both subjective and objective. So quotient map can so, be thought of as homeomorphism by its objective. And, and so that uh, it is the Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your definition of quotient topology, why is it that B is pi inverse of pi? So you're saying that you're saying
shape pi map from, from x to the big portion of on x, um, not tilde, but, um, oh, like, well, like, if, you, how can you be an element of, like, the topology of x? Um, if you is, like, sorry, a made of state check. Uh, since that pi inverse of p is an element set. Uh, okay, yeah, I that. So you, you take any three-dimensional piece of space and you project it onto the lower dimensional thing. Okay, yeah. That's going to be a cool thing. Um, so, where the you know, image of every point are the things that you're identifying. Everything that gets projected into the same point are the things that we call equivalent. <laughs> so basically, uh, take this map i from x to z to be defined by x comma y goes to x. So it takes any point here and projects it down to the x-axis. This is an example of a quotient map. Um, but what the quotient topology does, I'll, I'll explain that in just a second. So in this case, Z was an arbitrary set. Uh, and in this case, what we had as Z was a specific uh, partition of X. And in order to connect the two, all you have to do is define the equivalence relation as uh, two elements are equivalent if and only if pi of X is equal to pi of y in z. So any surjective map from a topological space to a set uh, uniquely identifies z as z equal to z. Is, is that what? Z equal to z. Yes. Uh, because z, uh, z can be basically thought of as those elements which are equivalent classes under this function pi. So you pi take the quotient topology, you take the quotient of z as that equivalent set here. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So what this quotient set is, uh, through this equivalence relation, any quotient set, the, the, the image is going to be some sort of partition of x. So you take x and split it up into a bunch of disjoint subsets. I want to show you two different logics, but the first yeah. logic is you take a set and you define an equivalent relation to pi, which means which point should I do it with which weighted, and define a quotient map based on the equivalence relation. Now the other way around is you can first give me a, a surjective map, right? and then I will define an equivalence relation for which that map is the Yeah. By, by introducing that equivalence. Exactly. Oh, okay. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So uh, here's an example to like put this into perspective. Let's say you take a disk. Well, um, just so that. Um, I mean, it's just that you want to capture as much of the topology of yeah. the space as you can. So if you can always pick the trivial power, and I will automatically be a quotient map for whatever you're in college. <laughs> right. But that's, right. not, that's not an interesting. So you always want to include as many. As many open sets as you possibly can while, make, while keeping pi as a quotient map. Okay. Yeah. So, Then pi is not a quotient map. Um, and that is this x. What do you mean? What's your point? Um, um, oh, for the for the square and the line. Yeah, square. So 
any open set can be written as unions of the interval on the line. Yeah, so. And the pre image of that would be the strip. And the strip is open in the square oh. under the easiest topology. So it's, you, you don't get to choose what points on the strips you want to strip you want to include in the pre image. The pre image is just every single point that maps into it. Yeah. Another example is if you take the disk and um, define the set Z as the union of two things. One, you take the boundary of the disk, which is the circle, the S1, and two, you just leave every other point as it is. Leave them separate, don't group them together. So this defines a partition of a disk where one partition, uh, one object is the boundary and every other object is every interior point in here. And call this a quotient space. You can always define an equivalence. You, you define the equivalence relation as two points are equivalent if they are on the boundary. Uh, what do you think is the quotient space for this? S2. Uh, because what you're effectively doing is taking the boundary, identifying them all as a single point, uh, a sphere. S1 is a circle. Yes. So uh, what you're doing is taking all the points on the boundary, identifying them all into a single point, gluing them down together. So we get this disk. And what should the be here? So you're deforming this disk and just contracting all these boundary points into a single thing to find the sphere. Right. Whenever you contract all this. So what, what quotienting does effectively is takes a bunch of points in your space, glues them together, and identifies them as a single point. It's a way uh, quotienting is a way of taking topological spaces and Um, so the partition you've defined is by saying that all the points of the boundary are equivalent. So you're going to identify them into a single point. But you want to make sure continuity is preserved because you want the projection map to be uh, a quotient map. So uh, you need to replace the boundary by a single point. But the boundary is uh, very close to every other point near the boundary. So you have to make that replacement appropriately. And the only way to do that is get a sphere. Explicitly doing that is just more work. So just, just to give you an intuitive picture of what quotient is all about. I mean, it's easier to check that it's a quotient map. Yeah. I mean, you check that open sets map to open sets. Just imagine uh, what they do. So let's say your the boundary corresponds to this point. Take any any open set on the surface of the sphere is going to be some open disk here. But it all contains that point. Yeah. If it contains this point, what do you think it's going? What's the pre image of that yeah. on the disk? Mm -hmm. right. An analogous. Something like this. That only includes the boundary points. And this is open in the subspace of all of the edges. Right. Yeah. Because uh, the projection is a quotient map, quotient map theory. So what about the interval? Like, it's just going to just be that. Uh, so if I take, let me draw this again. So if I take something like this, all of these points contract into one point, which is over here. 
So it looks like a disk with one point in it. It's still open. It does include this one single point. No, so, uh, so this this part of the boundary is including it. Yeah. Because this is an open set. That is. That's the problem. But everything that doesn't contain the points that you could factor it down, those are all open sets. Yeah. So then, so then open sets still map to open sets, don't they? Because in your original thing, it's not an open set. Yeah. No, but this, this is an open set in the subspace topology on the disk. Okay. So what's this? Uh, it's, a, it's an intersection of this circle with the disk. The circle itself is an open set. So, it's in, uh, so the subspace topology is the set of those sets which can be written as the intersection of the space with an open set in, the, in R2. Why don't you define a similar subspace topology of the space? That is, that is exactly what I'm working on. Uh, wait, but is this... Is this Point included or not? Sets that are that include part of the boundary. So the boundary here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this one, uh, the topology from the S2. Uh, the subspace topology uh, from R2. So when, when I say S2, I mean the subspace topology is used as the sphere being a subset of usually the three dimensional space. In that case, was it different?
covers X. So B is a subset of the power set. And what covers means is that for every X in X, there exists uh, an element B of the basis such that X is greater than And two, uh, for every X that belongs to some intersection of two basis elements, there exists a third basis element contained in this intersection, such that X is in this third basis element. So what the second condition does is eliminate the need to take uh, intersections of basis elements to create the topology. So that the second condition doesn't mean you don't have to refer to the final case. Yes. Yeah. Space x comma t, there exists a countable basis when x is separable. Do you not have to? You have to prove that this one is a topology. This is a. That this is a topology. Yeah, you do have to prove that. Uh, it's it's not trivial, uh, it, but it basically. Uh, because you're including all unions, you already have the closed down the arbitrary unions, but the fact that it's closed down the finite intersections comes as the second property as a fact that it covers X. Exercise. So basically, it's a smaller collection of open sets. That's still generates the whole by just taking them. Yeah. And of course, uh, every basis element is open as well because it satisfies this criterion, or it's a union of itself. So the, the base, so the basis is just the smallest collection of sets that you have, but it will still generate the entire topology. Yes. And it doesn't have to be the smallest. Uh, but just something smaller. Yeah. So then is there like a special name for the smallest basis? Um, the smallest complexity. Yeah. Okay. Because like you can have two different bases for the same topology that that such that one of them is not completely independent from the other for them. Uh, but yeah, trivial examples are the entire topology of the space and the basis for the topology. Uh, uh, open intervals on the real line are a basis for the standard topology on the real line, because 
every every uh, open set can be written as a union of open variables. Pretty standard topology. So remember that the definition of a separable set was that there exists a countable dense subset. And the proof of this is very simple. Uh, let's say you have a countable basis. Because it's, the basis is countable, you can label them by uh, an integer index n. Uh, because vn covers all of x, let's say we pick arbitrary points We'll show that the set Xn is uh, a countable dense subset. It's clearly countable because Vn is a countable set. But to show that it's dense, what we have to do is take any open set U uh, in the space and show that there exists at least one X. That is included in you. But that is trivial because by the definition of the topology generated by this basis, uh, a set U is open if and only if for every X in U there exists a basis at the end that covers that U. So for, for uh, which means that for every open set there is a basis element that is a subset of that, and pick the X N corresponding to that basis element. So you, for any open set you always have an element of this dense subset. So a set, a subset of X uh, will be defined to be open under this basis, under the topology generated by this basis, if and only if, uh, for all elements in U, there exists a basis element that is completely contained in U and contains X. So, um, but there's another The only reason I showed this was to prove that that's that's. But it's easier to prove using the other definition. <laughs> if open sets are just all unions of basis elements, right? And we we have a sequence of these x's from basis elements. Now, any open set is a union of basis elements, and therefore it contains a whole bunch of x's. Right. Right? Not all of the open sets, but so uh, by taking all all possible unions of these guys, you can generate all open sets. So, like on the real line, if you consider only open intervals uh, AB of the form A rational B rational, take them only rational numbers, right? Yeah. But by oh, taking okay. their unions, you can produce all. Way, way better than uh, the original 
Adjacent intervals uh, one to three and two to four. Then it's, uh, so this is not a basis, and here's why because there exists a point in this intersection, and there is no element of this basis that is included within two to three. It's different. Uh, so closure under intersections would imply that V1 intersection V2 is also an yeah. element basis. But that's, we're not requiring that. Yeah. We're just saying that for every point in V1 intersection V2, yeah. there has to be a, a third basis element so that, that is included. That is a basis. No, that's not a basis. Yeah. No, because there's no way to involve the yeah, there's there's no no basis. Basis. Yeah. Yeah. The intersection doesn't have to be in the basis. You just have to be able to fit a basis element into, into that. Basis. Exactly. Let me just finish with one more definition. Now that I've introduced a basis, uh, we can define, so let's say X and Y are topological spaces. We can always, as a set, define the Cartesian product X cross Y. But because X and Y are topological spaces, we're not going to make this a topological space. We need to define something more. Uh, which is a topology. Um, and this is called the product topology. So the product topology is the. Hmm? Oh, all right. <laughs> Any ideas? So, so we know what open sets are on X and what open sets are on Y. Yeah. Uh, think of think of all possible products. Yeah. Well, need to check that that's topology. Think of uh, just the rate plane, for example. The open disk is an open set. Can you write this as a Cartesian product of open sets on the real line? What can you write it as? You think of the power sets of x and y and just power, power, union two to the x. That's not even an element of x cross y. I mean, we're defining x cross y. Right? No, x cross y is a set of ordered doubles of it. Exactly. So you can write the circle as the union of all rectangles within the circle. Uh, so objects of the sort. So just. This is defined as uh, uh, dx cross y equals generated by uh, 
But there is a much simpler way to come up with a basis for this topology. And that is, if you have a basis for X and Y, you can just take Cartesian products of those. <laughs> sure. But yeah, so, I mean, in this case, it's clearly simpler because B prime is a subset of B. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a smaller basis that generates the same. 